Greetings, stranger. We are rapidly approaching Diabel, winding our way through the hills and small dells that flank the Deluge River. So I thought it would be prudent to stir you back to alertness, that you might be prepared for what you will encounter in Absalom's most important satellite town. Yes, indeed, Diabel is a critical component of the city at the centre of the world's defensive strategies, far more so than Eskadar, despite being over three times smaller. The reasons for this are mostly historical, but the town has enjoyed a rejuvenation of sorts in recent years, as Primarch Gear saw fit to bring its governance closer to the Grand Council's steadying hands. The locals tend not to see it that way, however. Indeed, you should be careful with what you say in Diabel. Its way of life is not at all dependent on the goodwill of you adventuring sorts, and residents will not hesitate to remind you of this should you decide to start asking probing questions. Therefore, let me tell you a bit about the history and politics of the back door to Absalom as we approach the Harpy's Gate, and then I will conduct a brief guided tour of its most notable locations. By the end, well, you will almost be able to pass for a local yourself. The story of Diabel begins with a century of violence. The god Eridan departed the city at the centre of the world around the year 401, and it was not long before his absence was exploited by foreign powers. At beginning in the year 430, flotillas of pirate vessels began to harass Absalom's shipping lanes and trade routes. Over time, these grew and grew until the island itself was effectively isolated from the rest of the Inner Sea region and besieged. Those flying the Black Flag would soon be joined by the privateers of rival states who saw an invaluable opportunity to bring the new nation low. Before long, the island's wealth had stagnated and the plunderers demanded to be paid in gold from its treasure vaults or suffer famine and further decay. To enforce their demand, they erected a great blockade of ships in Absalom's harbour in 446, so that not even the smallest of rowing boats could sneak past it unhindered. In fact, the most infamous thwarting of the blockade was not relief, but plague, as the vile disease known as the Yellow Death took the city when all armies had failed. Eventually, starving, impoverished and desperate, Absalom resolved to dispatch messages to all the peoples of the Inner Sea region, be they stately or outlawed, promising land and titles in return for their swords to break the pirate siege. The response to the call for aid was overwhelming, much to the surprise of the attackers and defenders alike. It seemed as though every person who could swing a sword or sling a spell was moved to action by Absalom's rallying cry and before long they all descended onto the blockade like flies to a corpse. Of course, I speak on the grand scale of history, and it would still take many decades of bloody battling to wrest control of the Cortosian shores away from its captors. But by 536, the city's officials declared the trial over. Unable to offer gold in reward, Absalom instead kept its promises of distributing land and titles, and many of its noble houses trace their lineages back to this period of the city's history, as does the Flotsam Graveyard. The town of Diabel was also founded around this time, and by the pirates, no less. They used the natural bay in this secluded part of the island to set up a long-term encampment, a staging ground for future assaults. The earliest sources actually refer to this camp as a derelict, and it was never intended to become anything more than a paramilitary headquarters. However, following the pirates' defeat and the lifting of their siege, many found themselves stranded far away from their homelands. Instead of risking a dangerous return journey, they turned to Derelict and decided to improve it and to make it suitable for settlement. Before long, it had been renamed to Diabel and it was fortuitously learned that the bottom of the harbour housed innumerable oyster and pearl beds. Combined with a growing lumber and fur industry, these resources proved sufficient to ensure its longevity, and the city at the centre of the world even began to open its gates to mutual trade. In time, it would quietly annex the formerly independent town under the authority of its Grand Council though until the rule of Primarch Gear, it remained largely independent. And this brings us to recent history, and to present politics. As you may recall from my tavern lecture on the truly bizarre government of Absalom, 
the domain of Cortos ultimately falls under the jurisdiction of its viceroy, currently a high councillor by the name of Yares Molinaro. Diabel itself was also granted a single seat, albeit on the low council, and these two officials between them held sway over the growing town. But Premark Gir changed this considerably by two separate measures. He first revoked the authority of the Cortos Viceroy over Diabel, and instead decreed that it would now be governed by a Primarch-appointed official known as its Teriarch. Naturally, Lord Gear determined that his longtime friend and ally, Sion Lord Arvid of House Arnson, would be best suited to this role, although Sion Lord Arvid himself accepted this begrudgingly, ever in pursuit of recognition and ever in the shadow of his more successful companion, the elderly wizard has spent much of the past four decades nursing his resentment for the title, which he sees as forced exile. Secondly, Premark Gier persuaded the Grand Council that Diabel was big enough to be considered an independent district entitled to more than a nomarch, and so created a new low council seat for this deputy position. However, he ensured that the appointer would not be the nomarch themselves, as is normal, but rather the terrier. The consequences of this and local politics we will return to when we reach the Consortium Citadel in town, but for now just be aware that this rather unique history has shaped Diabel from the very beginning. The locals are proud to be independent citizens free from Absalom's meddling, and their idea of a good life is one spent in quiet solitude, harvesting oysters and hunting game in the surrounding Diabel Hills. Also, while the town is safe enough, it is no secret that the harbour is used as a haven for smuggling illegal goods onto Cortos. The moniker, Backdoor to Absalom, is well earned, and you will not need to look very hard to see examples of somewhat creative interpretations of council tax laws. Ah, and here is our first point of interest on our right. Flanking the northern edge of the main road into Diabel is the shanty town of tents called the Scabbit Camp. The Scabbits are among the best hunters on Cortos, and the family has been trapping and ranging around the Diabel Hills, the Immenwood and the Swordlands for as long as anybody can remember. However, they are also wretchedly xenophobic to everyone who does not share their name, and indeed this extends even to their own partners. Decades of inbreeding have left the Scabbits somewhat temperamental at the best of times, and the locals do not consider them to be true citizens of Diabel. The current family patriarch, Maka Scabbit, saw fit to break this tradition only because he took a harpy to bride instead, or so the rumours whisper. Still, nowhere else in the Starstone Isles will you find furs of such pristine quality for such reasonable prices. Just be sure to wander into the Scabbit camp ready for anything, including a fight. Beyond the camp and the immediate environs of the town, up on the hill over yonder, lies the fort called Eagle Reach. It was constructed by Sion Lord Arvid to serve as his family's home once he was made Teriarch of Diabel, but for all its splendour, the man is seldom found within. It is no secret that these days he prefers the comforts of Absalom proper, and Sion Lord Arvid has consequently left the quotidian management of the Eagle Reach estate to his wife, Lady Nala. Their marriage was always a political one first, Lady Nala having been born into the wealthy House de Mac, so their physical separation has not affected them much. Indeed, although she is officially a humble councillor for the town, wielding little power, it is really Lady Nala who has the true run of Diabel, when the Cortos Consortium is not interfering, that is. And do not worry, we will come to them soon. First, let us pass into the town by venturing through this imposing structure, Harpy's Gate. Although it is hard to tell if you approach Diabel from the main road, the settlement walls were never actually completed, apparently after the locals realised that the most threatening visitors would not be marauding bandits or organised armies, but rather airborne harpies. The feathered humanoids have long plagued the Diabel Hills, and the extermination of their nests is perhaps one of the few reliable sources of income for adventurers and mercenaries who find themselves dwelling here. Consequently, the gatehouse is kept open at all hours, and the local guard force consists almost entirely of trained archers and arbalists manning the walls and scanning the skies above, with plugged ears, of course, for they are well versed in harpy lore. 
Instead of goods inspectors standing guard on the ground, Harpy's Gate is flanked by caravan masters soliciting incoming travellers and merchants, hoping to secure fees for the journey back to Absalom. Their prices are seldom reasonable, I should mark. Now, if we had instead turned southwards to follow this side lane parallel to the wall, then about 800 feet after its terminus we would have come to Devil's Pier, a constant source of worry and rumour to Diabellians. You see, due to the belligerent history between the infernal empire of Chaliax and the city at the centre of the world, there is a strict limit on the number of Chalish ships that can be docked in Absalom proper at any given time. Excess ships must instead await clearance here in Diabel, and even with this policy inviting dock fees and longer trips, there is always quite the queue. The government of Chaliax soon petitioned Sion Lord Arvid to cede a small section of the docks to its control, so that the Chalis ship captains might enjoy expedited processing. I understand that this request was granted after a truly monumental bribe found its way to Eagle Reach. Nevertheless, Devil's Pier was constructed exclusively for and to be managed by Chalaxians, and a large, windowless warehouse was built next to it for their goods. Then, one day, the administrators vanished and the warehouse was closed, and the Chalish ships began to use the public piers once more, offering nothing by way of explanation, I should add. A group of townsfolk investigated, but they too disappeared. The Teriarch was pressured to begin his own investigation, but nothing was done, and the Diabellians learned to give the warehouse a wide berth. Since then, the ground around the warehouse has begun to glow sometimes at night, and strange noises are often heard from within. Most people are convinced that some devil or other fiendish entity is trapped inside, bound beyond control or reason, and fear what may happen if it should be let loose, or the warehouse doors left open. Perhaps you should go and see for yourself, if you dare. Ah, now here is our first proper Diabellian building. Immediately past Harpy's Gate lies the Hall of the Teriarch, Absalom's claim to power over the town. Inside lie offices and administrative posts, nothing worth elaboration, to be sure. It is rather the architecture and the outside construction that is important, because it serves as a symbol of Primarch Gear's new order for this part of Kortos. The walls are made from countless mother-of-pearl tiles, fitted together so seamlessly that you would need sharper eyes than mine to spot the grooves. These spiralling towers lead to glistening domes that seem magically to amplify the sun or moonlight, thereby gifting the hall with a splendid radiance at all hours. And all of this is made doubly effective when it is contrasted with the otherwise humble and sea-scarred buildings that surround it and make up the rest of Diabel. To my mind, this visual spectacle does more than any amount of exposition in explaining the differences between the city at the centre of the world and even one of its most important satellites. This is not lost on the locals either, by the way. As we head south towards the docks, I should explain that we are now in one of three districts within the town. As far as Absalom's Grand Council is concerned, all of Diabel is one homogeneous entity, but the locals take a different view. To them, we are now touring around the Bristles district, home to the true salt-of-the-sea, clay-of-the-earth type folks. Its borders are the unfinished wall to the east and south, and the end of flat ground to the north, which then rises sharply into the wealthier snout district that overlooks it. The final district is the Claw, which is the town's outskirts beyond the walls, and on the other side of the deluge. Scholars of Diabell lore debate how far south the Claw District reaches, with one faction contending that the etymology of the term demands that the Claw grip both of the other districts like a crab or crawfish would, and another faction countering that the locals rarely refer to anything south of Harpy's Gate as the Claw District. Incidentally, this next Bristles location is burdened with another, even more divisive linguistic debate. Welcome to Picapel Market. Lining the piers of the Diabell docks like so many slates on a roof, Picapel vendors are ever keen to hawk their pelts and pearls to tourists and locals alike. The fur traders claim that the market's name derives from the constant cries of pick a pelt, but the oyster hucksters rather maintain that their stall's exclamations of pick a pearl 
are the market's real origin story. I have found that the most elegant solution is to hold no opinion on the matter, for this minimizes your chances of being thrown into the filthy waters of the harbour, which also hosts all the litter and residue of the town. Nevertheless, you should still peruse the less obvious stalls around here, particularly in the alleyways and side lanes. Diabel might not be as famous as Otari for adventuring, but it holds a significant population advantage, and far more trade flows through its streets. The locals might not see much use for esoteric magic items and rare materials, but they can still be found scattered around Picapel. Just be sure not to arouse the suspicions or ire of the Kortos Consortium as you browse, for this marketplace belongs to them. On that note, I think it is about time we discussed the organization in some detail, no? Very well, but let us do so as we meander past their headquarters, which is located there, on the northern edge of the main dock piers. It is called the Consortium Citadel, and it blends in very well, mimicking the local architecture perfectly, before going somehow beyond it in scale and majesty. While the well-to-do in Diabel might decorate their homes with bronze or iron workings from the sea, the Consortium refuses to adorn their offices in anything less than the finest emerald, all locally sourced, of course. Officially, the Kortos Consortium is a guild specialising in location rather than product. It claims to represent the interests of the merchants of all lands on Kortos beyond Absalom itself, and on the surface this is indeed true. The KC settles disputes, addresses local grievances, and petitions the Grand Council for funding and support when hard times befall Cortosians. The guild has its fingers in many pies, up to and including the cornucopia of the Cortos Viceroy herself, or so the rumours claim. For the longest time, it had complete dominance of all serious business on Cortos unshielded by the city at the centre of the world, including the trading of furs, lumber, precious metals, pearls, the lot. Recently, however, it has been revealed that the Consortium does not enjoy having its monopolies challenged. When House Menhemes developed the Otari flume and lumber industry in a formerly impoverished fishing village, the Consortium tried to sabotage its growth. When an entrepreneuring dwarven mining company established an expedition to the southern Diabel Hills approaching Galijur in search of some long-lost forge, the Consortium had the responsible foreman assassinated. When the Teriarch appointed local watchmaker Bothuk Thrask to the Diabel Council in 4715 to serve as its second low council representative, the consortium attempted to assassinate him as well, three times. At its heart, therefore, the consortium is a trade cartel, and I suspect this is why Primarch Gia sought to undercut its influence by creating the position of Teriarch to oversee its hometown. I should stress, however, that these illicit activities were never definitively proved, or the KC would surely have been closed long ago. The majority of its business practices are legitimate, and even benign. It is well liked in Diabel, and it even hosts a spring festival here each year, where all labourers drink and make merry for free. It attracts many tourists from Absalom, and floods the town with coin. So be very careful how you discuss the consortium to local Diabellians. Very few have lived beyond the Guild's grasp, and even fewer have borne witness to the dangers it poses to free trade and free traders. All that said, there is perhaps one family that the Consortium will not cross, and it is hardly the likes of House Arnson. No, it is rather the family responsible for the management of this humble smokehouse that sits only 200 feet away from the citadel overlooking the bay. They are the Caldroons, and they command the respect and pride of every other Diabellian family in town, and most of those out of town too. The Caldroons were among the first to settle in Diabell permanently, perhaps even when it was still called derelict, and for over 4,000 years now have continued to ply their trades in the bristles, oyster diving and fishing primarily. Caldroon Smokehouse, as this establishment is called, has long been recognised as neutral territory for all the factions and faces in Diabel. The wealthiest caravan masters rub shoulders with the poorest of dock workers inside its open hall along its long benches. 
Anyone who insults the town's decency or disrespects its traditions is dealt with swiftly, as is anybody who insults the Caldroon oyster stews that are so popular here. The smokehouse could be the one place of clemency and safety you will find in Diabel if you are pursued by outside forces, and all this is only a stone's throw from the Cortos Consortium's headquarters. Such is the power of family tradition here. Let's take a moment now to behold the harbour before us. Following the Siege of the Prophets, during which one invasion force was sunk to the bottom of this area of coastline, the water was renamed to Ungrateful Bay, and many of the vessels were dredged into an artificial reef of sorts bearing an uncanny resemblance to the Flotsam Graveyard. Indeed, the town was inspired by Absalom's defensive ingenuity, and the subsequent naval barricade is called the Trawl. However, unlike the Flotsam Graveyard, which is well regulated by the Harbour Master's Grange, the Pilots' Union, and patrolled by the Star Watch and the Wave Riders, the Trawl has no equivalent officials. Instead, it has criminal enforcers, specifically a well-organised local family calling themselves the Barge Gang, but known around here by its leader's surname, the Carbies. The Carbies have secured a stranglehold over inbound sea trade that would make even the Consortium blush, and they are sure to take a small cut of every ship that would make port here. Those who refuse regularly join the Troll, making access further impassable to the next plucky sea punk feeling lucky. Given that this extortion is entirely unsanctioned, there have been attempts to disrupt the Carby's operations from within Diabell. Unfortunately, the family has proven itself to be quite adept at hiding its wealth in the many sea caves and hidden crevices in the Diabell Hills and none of the locals really begrudge some additional wealth being siphoned into the town's coffers. That barge there, though, is not run by the Carbies. Notice how, well, intact it is? That is actually a fine dining restaurant and a discreet brothel called Wisps on the Water, run by the enigmatic Verisian bard called Solodri. Local dock workers claim that she was born the daughter of a nymph and grew up to be so beautiful and so enrapturing that her envious fey ancestors cursed her never to set foot onto land. I personally find that tale quite fanciful, but it is true to say that nobody has ever seen her leave her floating home, and her enterprise has only benefited from such salacious scuttlebutt. The name, though, comes not from the owner, but from the dancing lights that seem permanently to surround wisps on the water acting as beacons for townsfolk wishing to cross the Troll and reach the safety of Solodri's establishment. Whether these come from some permanent spell, magical artifact, or are, as the dock workers believe, enthralled sprites suspended above the bay, we may never know. But they have certainly saved many a drunken sailor's life on their return journey back to the shore after a night to remember. We will now turn eastwards and towards the bridge out of town to complete the tour, but first I have three more locations of interest to point out to you. The first two are seemingly rival gaming dens, though this perception could not be further from the truth. Here on our left is Zamlin's Druge Den, a two-story, black-stoned inn that specialises in the wildly addictive Vudrun game of Draj, but somehow bastardised into Druge in common. Its rules are stunningly complicated for a gambling game, but the fundamentals rely on the management of competing obsidian black and ivory white tiles around a labyrinthine board. Each tile is painted with a different monstrous creature or menacing animal, like a hydra, an elephant, or the wildcard chimera. The den is run by the half Vudrani Talika Zamlin and the income from his inn and Druzhden has proved more than enough for him to live a very comfortable life at the foot of the Snout District. More or less any and every other gambling game is instead provided by this three-storey white stone building on our right, called Hoag's Rickets and Rumples. Rickets is an absurdly rigged game that occasionally delivers life-changing payouts to the lucky few who beat the house, while Rumples is a more technical game that revolves around the folding of cards to create increasingly memorable marks. If you need clarification on what these entail, then you're not alone, and Hoag's Game Masters would be more than happy to explain them in intricate, 
some would say excruciating, detail. Of course, first you would need to agree to play a hand or five. Despite the name, the establishment is actually far more diverse in its offerings than its two titular games. Bards and other musicians regularly give performances here, and the place is also the number one spot in town for fine dining, assuming you are not interested in the carnal pleasures that accompany Salotri's restaurant out on the trawl. Mr. Fillion Hoag himself is a halfling gentleman from Taldor, who likes to tell anyone who will listen that there is a bounty on his head back in his home nation. Believe it or not, that is one of the least incredible stories he has at his fingertips, and he has presented me with some evidence to back it up. For the budding Diabell tourist, I suggest renting a room at Zamlin's Druzden and spending your evenings here for some well-earned rickets and rumples, or R&R, as we call it. The steep slopes up to the Snout District would lead us northwest here, and they would undoubtedly offer a commanding view of the surrounding coast and countryside at their end, but I do not think there is anything else up on the Snout that demands a tourist's attention. However, I will tell you about Munali Manor, which can be found at the northwestern end of that road. It was constructed in 4708 by the freeboater captain Sifo Munali, who had retired with much wealth and fame secured. He has spent the past decade and a half living a quiet, prosperous life here in Diabell, and has fostered good terms with the locals, who normally struggle to recognise anyone less than a third-generation immigrant as a true Diabellian. I mention this because of the little-known fact that Mr. Munali was for considerable time a privateer paid by Andoran, and has remained on friendly terms with that nation's naval assets. He has kept a watchful eye over the trade of Diabell, and I would recommend turning to him before investigating the Devil's Pier, if this is the sort of gossip that captures your attention. He has many parallels to Tamali Tandavale of the Otari fishery, though as a privateer and not as an official naval officer, you would do well to be discreet about with whom you share this information. And now we come to our final destination today, the Red Bridge and its Pearl Market. The reason for its name should be self-evident, and it is built sufficiently high across the Deluge River that the market stalls actually extend beneath its arch as well. The pearl trading itself is a comparatively recent addition to this marketplace, and represents its prosperous growth in recent years. But you can also find a whole host of other stores and vendors flanking it on all sides. About a decade ago, the Red Bridge briefly became a hotspot for travelling wizards, who saw fit to use it from which to stage jewels either side of the river. The intent, I think, was to attract the attention of Scion Lord Arvid, himself a highly accomplished wizard, in hopes of stewardship or other pedagogy. While these jewels did attract the Teriarch's attention, the only thing they accomplished, besides damaging the market's flow of trade, was to have the practice of duelling banned within a hundred yards of the Red Bridge, and the responsible would-be students expelled from the town. It seems the grizzled old mage put mentoring behind him some years ago. Travelling across the bridge puts you into the Claw District, though there is little there for tourists. Instead, the Claw District contains the homesteads of those few Diabellians who can stomach living inland, as being any farther than about 1,000 feet from the shoreline is considered here. Chiefly, these people are hunters and fur trappers, and so this area is also the place to visit for staging longer expeditions into the wilds of Kortos, which, if done prematurely, or by the unprepared and uncounseled, will most likely lead to deadly tragedy. Well, stranger, that is Diabell. For a large town with a population somewhere between four and five thousand, it is quite queer in its own way. It claims to value peace and quiet, for so it does from the perspective of most locals, but it is simultaneously the beating heart of shadowy trade deals, and the epicentre of almost all smuggling on Kortos. In a peculiar twist of fate, it most closely resembles the city it claims to shun. Still, for this tour guide, it is an excellent resting spot on Kortos, as it is far enough away from Absalom to feel unique whilst remaining secure compared to much of the rest of the island. Moreover, from Diabell we can take a ship to Eskadar, the second largest Absalomian settlement by population 
and the de facto capital of the Isle of Erin to the north of Kortos. I think we will journey there next, after recovering from our travels in an inn tonight. As usual, I will share more general knowledge from such comfort then, most likely Zamlin's Druzhden, before departing for Eskadar in the morning. I would be honoured if you joined me, for very soon we will conclude our tour of the Starstone Isles and depart for lands hitherto untouched by my tales. I assure you, there will be no part of Galarian's law left undocumented by the time I retire from touring. But we must journey one step at a time. So, I hope to see you at the den tonight. Well, until then.